back in the mid 80s. Uh, my passion is social justice and economic equity. And in trying to discover the root causes of the world's problems, I quickly zeroed in on money and banking as a fundamental problem. And uh, I tried to share what I learned in my first book, Money and Debt, A Solution of the Global Crisis, in 1989 and 90. And then I wrote another book called New Money for Healthy Communities in 1994. And this third book, uh, Understanding and Creating Alternatives to Legal Tender, came out in 2001. Now, that book is pretty much a survey of alternative exchange mechanisms, uh, historical and contemporary. Uh, the fourth book came out uh, two years ago, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization. Uh, that's out on the book table. And that's a more general perspective on not only economics and politics, but uh, finance and money uh, in a general context. So today I want to present uh, the emerging butterfly society, what I see as a, a positive outcome of this difficulty that we're going through. Uh, the industrial era is coming to an end, and the world is going through what I consider to be a metamorphic change. Uh, this isn't just another uh, cycle in a long series of cycles. This is, I think, a, a unique turning. And the new convivial era, as I call it, uh, is emerging. I take the word convivial from Ivan Illich, uh, one of the mentors that is foremost uh, in my background. And this quote from Richard Bach, I think, uh, uh, tells the story, what the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls the butterfly. So if we hold on to the past and try to relate to the caterpillar, we're going to have great difficulty. Now, I don't have to tell you about the mega crisis that we're facing. Uh, there's been a lot said about that, and we've all uh, pretty much uh, digested the dimensions of it. But what I've discovered and, and what I firmly believe is that exponential growth is killing us. And we've had some discussion already uh, this week about exponential growth. And there are a number of things that are growing exponentially. Uh, I focus on three, atmospheric carbon dioxide, uh, human population, and debt. And I'm going to zero in on the debt aspect because I believe that the driver of unsustainable growth is the debt money system based on compound interest. The enabler is cheap fossil fuel energy, but that's not the driver. The thing that has driven industrial civilization is interest-bearing debt. The break, of course, is mother nature. So money is the key factor in understanding our predicament and getting uh, around it. So the specialization of labor means that uh, we get most of what we need by trading with others. And money is the facilitating mechanism uh, for doing that. Now, whoever controls money controls everything else. And this is becoming ever more clear. Uh, the political money regime centralizes power and concentrates wealth. And it undermines popular government and forces artificial growth because there is a debt imperative built into the money system, and out of that debt imperative comes the growth imperative. This erodes the social fabric and destroys the environment as well as our uh, democratic government. Uh, this is a, a chart showing the uh, f future value of uh, a single dollar at interest, whether it's an investment or a debt. If you borrow a dollar and you are charged interest on it, uh, the far line, the solid line, shows uh, an interest rate of 6%. Uh, the dashed line shows an interest rate of 10%. Now, you can see how, at some point, it reaches uh, a break where it shoots astronomically uh, upward. Here are the numbers that are behind those charts. Uh, now, the time period is long in terms of one human lifetime, but it's not a long time in terms of history or national governments. And you can see these are astounding numbers. Uh, if you go out 200 years, one single dollar of debt at 6%, if you were not to make any payments, 
would mount up to $115,000 in debt 200 years hence. So if you raise the interest rate to 10%, it's only four percentage points, doesn't seem like a whole lot, but you see how much difference it makes. 189, almost $190 million, that's one single dollar growing over 200 years. Now this isn't just theoretical, here's the empirical evidence we're seeing uh, debt for all sectors in the United States growing over time from 1965 until 2007. Uh, the latest figures make it look even worse. Well, back in 1965, uh, we had a total debt uh, for all sectors of the economy of about $1 trillion. That was, at the time, about one and a half times GDP. If you look what happened, uh, over time and look at 2007, now we've got a uh, total debt for all sectors of about $51 trillion, or about three and a half times GDP. Now a lot of people say, well, the debt has to grow because uh, population is growing. Well, we're seeing that the debt has grown much faster than population and much faster than economic output. So we need to explain that. What's the reason for that? And the reason is this uh, artificial growth dynamic that's caused by the interest-bearing debt money system. Now here is the US government portion of that debt uh, and you can see what's happened to that. Uh, just within the last few years, uh, three and a half years actually, we've seen it increase by about 45 percent. And the government is projecting annual deficits of about a trillion and a half dollars into the foreseeable future. And those those estimates are often uh, understated. So in order to understand this, you have to understand how money is created. And Steve alluded to this. Uh, here's my simplistic way of uh, describing it. You go to a bank and you say, I want to buy a house, give me a mortgage. So the bank will uh, assess your credit worthiness. And if they approve the mortgage, they will give you the loan. They make two entries on their books. Your mortgage note, which you sign as an asset on their books, and they create an offsetting liability, which is a deposit to your account. So now you have the money to buy the house. So banks create the money in the form of deposits or account balances when they grant a loan. The problem is that as interest accrues, the supply of money available to repay the loan is inadequate. The only way you can uh, uh, service your loan is if you can go into the market and earn enough money uh, to pay both the principal and the interest payments. But that money came into ex existence in the same way. So the, the people that borrowed uh, money from the banks are not all able to repay what they owe. Uh, the system forces some to fail. So what we're seeing is a systematic failure of conventional money in banking. The political money system is shaking itself apart. We're seeing ever more extreme bubbles and bust cycles. And this latest uh, this latest cycle was based on uh, the real estate bubble with a tremendous expansion of debt into the private sector on the basis of real estate transactions. The banks relaxed their standards and so they invited anyone and everyone to come in and borrow money to buy real estate. So the prices of real estate were bid up in the market because you now had more buyers and every time the property turned over that justified a higher mortgage loan on that property. But eventually, of course, some people are unable to pay and the whole thing begins to unravel. Uh, at the same time, uh, we're seeing government action to try to uh, ameliorate the problem. And they're doing it by reducing people's incomes. Uh, first of all, we see reduced incomes because of the unemployment and underemployment resulting from uh, the economic crash. And we're seeing increases in the cost of living, uh, particularly in uh, necessities. Every time I come back from abroad, I see the price of my grocery bill go up. Uh, at the same time, uh, the savings are being destroyed by debasement of the currency as more and more government debt is monetized. So what needs to be done? Uh, I think we need to transcend the political debt money system. It cannot be reformed because the people that created it created it for their own purposes 
and they're not going to change it. We need to uh, transcend it, go around it. We need to rebuild local economies. We need to phase out our dependence upon fossil fuels. I think everybody here agrees on that. Uh, we also need to decouple livelihood and income from work. Uh, now this is a, a point that has been made by a number of different people. Uh, Hubbard, who's famous for the Hubbard curve, also contends that we need to do this. Well, I'm only going to talk about the first two of these. We don't have time to get into the rest. But what I'm seeing is this metamorphic change in society. We're moving from superfluous accumulation, violent conflict, and wasteful consumption toward a sustainable uh, economy where we relocalize and provide a dignified life for all. Now, I contrast the caterpillar behavior to the butterfly behavior. If you look at what happens in the caterpillar stage, the caterpillar just eats and grows. That's all it does. And uh, it goes through a period uh, uh, of perhaps weeks or months. And eventually, there's something in the caterpillar program that says stop. It reaches a maximum size, and then it goes into the, uh, the shell, the cocoon, or the chrysalis, and it begins to break down. I think that's the phase that we're entering now. We're entering the breakdown phase of the economy, the caterpillar economy. And uh, what's happening in that process is there are already in the caterpillar body what are called imaginal cells or imaginal buds that are the emergent butterfly. So these imaginal cells become active. They feed off the nutrient soup of the decaying caterpillar body. They begin to join up and form the new butterfly body. Now, the behavior of the butterfly is quite different. The behavior is uh, uh, co-creative. Uh, it flies around, pollinates plants in the process of gathering nectar. It's not destructive like the caterpillar. Um, so I'm looking forward to the emergence of the, the butterfly society. So we're moving out of this uh, continuous growth phase where we measure progress by quantitative measures, where capital accumulation is the be-all and end-all of capitalism, uh, where resource consumption is increasing uh, at ever greater rates, where labor productivity is the main emphasis of business because labor is an expense, and we have growing disparities of wealth and power. That's our consumer society. Uh, out of this, we're coming to the butterfly society, where we're going to have a steady state of output. We're going to emphasize qualitative measures of value and well-being. We're going to restore the commons, reverse the privatization process that's been ongoing for decades or centuries. Uh, we're going to look at resource productivity, getting more value out of each pound of uh, material or each barrel of oil, and less emphasis on getting more value out of each unit of labor. So we're going to move toward more labor-intensive uh, processes and we'll have more equitable distribution of wealth and power. It's what I call the convivial society. Now, the signs that this is happening are things like transition initiatives, uh, sustainability groups all over. Uh, now we have the Occupy movement, social networks, community currencies, and cashless exchange. These will be key in the emerging uh, economy. Now, I want to review the essential elements in the political money system. We have a credit monopoly uh, in the hands of a banking cartel. And the central bank is the head of the banking cartel. It sort of regulates uh, and allocates the money creation power amongst its members. Uh, we have a legal tender currency, which is a favored currency uh, uh, legislated by the government that says you must accept this in payment. The fact is that money has gone through a number of stages in its evolution, and what right now, money is credit. It's lent into circulation at interest, and it requires the endless expansion of debt, as I said, either by lending into the private sector or the public sector. Now, here's the way it happened. Uh, I'm calling the credit commons uh, the, vast uh, the vast pool of credit that is our collective credit which we give to the banks and then beg them to lend some of it back to us. <laughs> now, during this last bubble, we had banks, as I said, lending into the private sector on the basis of real estate. Now, most of that 
was taken over by the public sector in the bailouts. Not all of it, some of it was written off, but the banks go kicking and screaming down this route and Angela Merkel is trying to get the banks to write off 50% of the, of the Greek debt and they're not having any of it. Uh, so bank credit has become unreliable to the productive sector, especially the small and medium-sized enterprises, while it's being lavished on government and the military industrial complex. So the political money system favored the, favors the demands of big banks, big corporations, and big business. What we have to do is to insulate but not isolate local economies. I think the, the way out of our predicament is to relocalize. That's a means to an end. It's not necessarily an end in itself. Uh, the means to re-empowering ourselves, the people. Uh, we need to enhance economic vitality, reduce exploitation, and absentee ownership, enable self-determination, and optimize our standard of living. Uh, I use the analogy of a small boat harbor. The, uh, the globalization, as it's been foisted off on us, has been sort of like taking down all the seawalls that protect the small boat harbors in order to make markets accessible to the big multinational corporations. So, the backbone of any economy is its small and medium-sized enterprises. They need to be protected. The age-old argument that economists have between free trade and protectionism, I think, is a vain argument. We need to manage both. So we need to rebuild the seawalls and protect our small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, the devolution of power will come by reclaiming the credit commons, that is, by allocating our credit directly to one another according to our own uh, values and objectives. Also, we need to shift our nest egg, our savings and investment, uh, out of Wall Street and into Main Street, and we need to become more entrepreneurial. In America, we're very accustomed to uh, finding a company to hire us and give us a job and hope we are able to maintain that job for the rest of our lives until we're ready to retire. Uh, most of the world doesn't operate that way. Most of the world is entrepreneurial. So as far as the investment and savings are concerned, people are choosing to spend locally, save locally, and invest locally to enhance the uh, resilience of their local economies. The important thing that I emphasize in all of my books is uh, the creation of alternative exchange media. We can do this with local currencies, or with what I call credit clearing systems. And there is lots of precedent for this. The way it works, a credit clearing system is basically an association of people who come together and agree that they are going to trade with one another without money. What we do is simply keep a record of debits and credits on a ledger. When you buy something, your account is debited. When you sell something, your account is credited. So we start off with uh, one of the members who can issue credit buying something from another member. And that credit can then circulate throughout the association, but eventually the issuer has to redeem it for real value in goods and services. Now, this is, uh, this is the Veer Bank in Basel, Switzerland. The, the Veer was set up in 1934 as a cooperative uh, in the midst of the Great Depression, because in Switzerland, as in the United States, there was a dearth of official money in circulation. And so businesses came together to try to figure out how they could continue to do business and prosper, uh, even though they didn't have any money. Well, they used this credit clearing process. And uh, they still survive after 75 years there are about 60,000 business members throughout Switzerland doing about $2 billion in transactions annually. Now, the Veer has since become a conventional bank that also does Swiss franc deposits and loans. We also have the commercial barter industry. It's not really barter, it's credit clearing. These are private, for-profit companies that recruit members amongst the business community to do business on a non-cash basis. So again, it's a matter of keeping track of debits and credits. Uh, there, are, there are hundreds of these trade exchanges around the world. These are just a few of them. And uh, there are uh, hundreds of thousands of businesses that are 
members of one or another of these trade exchanges. So the benefits of this kind of uh, community currency and exchange credit is that we provide an independent means of payment, reducing our dependence on bank borrowing and reducing the risk of insolvency because now we don't have to come up with dollars that we can't uh, necessarily earn from the market. Uh, the credit that we create is more easily earned back. Also, we can externalize some of this credit to the general community. Uh, the association can issue vouchers, which can then enable its members to buy from non-members in the community. So we create a supplemental exchange medium that acts as a counter-cyclical uh, factor in the dollar economy. Uh, it enables local businesses to better compete with large corporate chains and it enables more complete use of available labor and resources. Some of the projects and organizations that are doing one or the other of these things, uh, Transition USA, Move Your Money, the Slow Money Alliance, Green America, Bali, and in fact Bali is going to have their annual convention here outside of Grand Rapids next year. Uh, and I encourage people to attend that. And we have uh, banks now forming that are trying to balance profitability with ecology, environment, and uh, employment. So my prescriptions for community economies is not to compete with other economies, not to try to bring some large company in from outside and bribe them with all kinds of tax concessions and so on, but to nurture the businesses that are already in your community, uh, invest in local infrastructure and enterprises, reduce dependence on imports and exports, produce for local consumption, and enhance opportunities for local exchange by making local businesses aware of one another, and then provide an alternative means of payment through credit clearing or local currency. So we need to increase the local value added and monetize that value added with a local currency or credit clearing system. Now what I see as the future prospects, uh, we're going to see the proliferation of non-bank uh, credit clearing and local currencies. Uh, we're going to see private currencies issued by businesses. Uh, frequent flyer mi miles can be considered a, a private currency. And there's lots of precedent uh, for historical currencies issued by business companies. And we'll see internet payments systems uh, evolving uh, to transfer non-bank credit. So the challenge before us is to find our place in the butterfly. We don't need to petition government to pass any new legislation. We don't need to beg the powers that be to change the banking laws. What we need to do is to reclaim our own credit and allocate it according to our own wishes and values. So thank you.